all of us want to have fulfilling relationships. We want to have relationships that actually change our character. We want relationships that are going to make us better people. And that's exactly what God wants for us. And so today, open to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to continue our study in the book of Ephesians. However, today's passage, we're going to have to go back just a little bit to verse 18. We're starting in verse 22 today, but really we have to go back to verse 18 to get the context of it. And what we're really talking about and what Paul is talking about is the most significant passage in all of the New Testament on marriage. And marriage is so significant. However, if you're not married, please don't check out because I know some of you that aren't married will someday be married. So you need to listen to this. Also, if you just have relationships with people, which all of us do, the principles here apply to every relationship. In addition, there is deep spiritual insight into our relationship with Christ in this very passage that we're going to be looking at. You could call this message enriching our relationships and particularly our relationship with God. So let's get into it. Ephesians 5 beginning in verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now we saw that what Paul was telling us is that we can live a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is absolutely essential, completely critical, if we're going to live the lives God wants us to live. If we're going to deal with issues in our own life, we need to be filled with the Spirit. If we're going to deal with relational issues, we need to be filled with the Spirit. If we are going to face the powers of darkness, we must be filled with the Spirit. So that's his point. And we've said, you ask to receive the infilling of the Spirit. Because there is an indwelling of the Spirit. When you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, but then he comes upon you. And when he does, he inspires and empowers your speech. And we need to have empowered speech. But there's not just one infilling of the Spirit. There was a continual infilling of the Spirit in the New Testament. So you not only ask for it, but you actually can stir it up. Say, I'm going to live a Spirit-filled life. And that's what's required to carry out what Paul's going to ask us to do here. Verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is simply saying, here's a way to know if you're spirit filled, you're constantly praising God and you are constantly giving him thanks. Now let me say this, if you're spirit filled, it's gonna lead to you praising and thanking God and I also believe praising and thanking God leads to being spirit-filled. They affect each other. And then he says in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, this is in context. He's saying if we're going to submit to one another, we're going to have to be filled with the Spirit because we naturally don't want to submit to one another. We want to promote ourselves. We are by nature self-centered people. We primarily think about ourselves and what's going to be best for us. And the only way to overcome that and to submit to others is to be filled with the Spirit. So we've got to be filled with the Spirit. And what we're looking at today is how we walk in what the Bible calls covenant love. A love not based on feelings or emotions or preferences, but based on a covenant. So the first observation from this text and the first key to walking in covenant love is that we must be spirit-filled, spirit-filled submission in the fear of God. That's what we all must have, spirit-filled submission in the fear of God. As I said, by nature, none of us want to submit. All of us want to promote ourselves. All of us want to have what's best for us. We want to lead. We want to be in charge. So we need the infilling of the Spirit to be able to submit to one another. Now that word submit is actually a military term. It's the Greek word hupo tasso. And it comes from a military terminology. In the military, based on rank, people in the military submit to one another. Now, that's not uncommon. We understand that. But he's saying there needs to be that kind of submission in all of life. 
For instance, the Trinity itself, God himself is submitted to himself. We all know that God is one. He's one in substance, but he's three in person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Trinity is co-equal and co-eternal. However, the Son submits himself to the Father. Now, did you see that? God submits to God. So this is something that God does himself. He submits within the Godhead. So he continually tells us that we need to do the same thing, starting with our submission to God. Where we say, Father, I want your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. I submit my life to you. I want your will for my life because I know you want what's best for me. I want you to be the leader of my life because we're submitted to God. But understand, even though God is the ultimate authority, he has also ordained delegated authority. And we're to submit to delegated authority. We see that in Romans 13, 1, where it speaks of submitting to government authorities. However, we're going to see a caveat throughout this passage, and here's what it is, because you've got to keep it in context of the whole Bible. We're to submit to governmental authorities unless governmental authorities tell us to do something that's contrary to the Scripture. They can't tell you to do something contrary to your Christian conscience and to the Scripture. At that point, you have to even rebel against government authority. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says that we're to submit to church leaders. Well, that's wonderful and good unless those church leaders are telling you things contrary to the Scripture. Then you cannot submit to them. In this passage, wives are told to submit to their husbands. Children are told to obey their parents. Slaves are told to obey their masters. And in our Western sensibilities, we reject that. We say that's nonsense. We can't live that way. That's not how people are supposed to live here in the time in which we live. But I want you to understand, in that culture, none of those comments would have been considered radical. Everybody would have said, of course, yeah, that, that's how you should be. What they would have thought was radical, what they would have thought was crazy is the next thing Paul says. He says, husbands are to love their wives to the point they're willing to lay their lives down for their wives. They would have said, that's nonsense, that's crazy, that's absurd. They're told parents aren't to exasperate their children. And they would have said, you've got to be crazy. I can do whatever I want with my children. They're my children. And then they would read, masters are to treat their household slaves kindly and fairly. They would have said, those slaves are my property. They're human machines. I can treat them however I want. So what to us was considered crazy in our day, they would have considered normal. And what we would have considered normal in our day, they would have considered crazy. <laughs> Folks, Bible is above culture. God is above culture. Culture is always changing, but God's word always remains the same. So we always have to go with God's word. And in that day, women were not considered those who you would love to the point of laying your life down for. In fact, Greek statesman Demosthenes, he was a very well-known man in that day. He said this, we have courtiers that, that was high-end prostitutes for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. We have wives for the purpose of having children legitimately and of having faithful guardians for all of our household affairs. Now, that was the culture they were living in. And Paul is saying, we're not going to live according to that culture. We're going to live according to heaven's culture. Husbands, you're going to love your wives in such a way that you are willing to lay your life down for them. And really what we're talking about is covenant love. And what is a covenant? Well, Job 31 tells us that marriage is a covenant. And in the marriage covenant, and every culture understood this, in a covenant, it was an undissolvable union where two separate parties became one legally, they became one functionally, and in the Bible, they became one spiritually. That 
is a covenant. And that is the kind of love that God is saying we're to have for one another, but we're particularly to have in a marriage relationship. That's why in a wedding, I, I remember Kelly in my wedding, we violated everything I tell couples to do in a wedding ceremony. You know, I tell them, you know, keep it short. People like it short. Ours was long. We had multiple songs. Kelly wanted an additional three songs. So we put them at the beginning before the wedding. And, we, 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 you know, we went on and on in this. We prayed and we, I mean, we had a Holy Ghost revival in our wedding. It was a long wedding. But, you know, none of that mattered that much. What mattered was the vows. You can have an extravagant wedding. You can have an expensive wedding. You can have a cheap wedding. And my daughter, praise God, believe, I'm believing for that. You can have a cheap wedding. You can have a long, short wedding. It doesn't matter. But what you have to have are the vows. Because that's what it's all about. Your wedding can be really short, but you need to focus on the vows. Because the vows is really what a marriage ceremony is all about. I'm going to read to you the vows that Kelly and I gave each other on our wedding day, we said to one another, I promise, did you hear that? I promise, that's what a wedding vow is. I promise to love you, to be faithful to you in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live from this day forward. Now, I want you to see what the vows had nothing to do with. We didn't say, oh, I feel all emotionally in love with you right now. I, I feel a, a quiver in my liver. I, I find you extraordinarily attractive right now. My emotions are very strong for you at this moment. It, it wasn't any of that. In fact, it had very little to do with the moment. It had everything to do with the future. And I'm saying, I am committed to you. I'm going to be for you no matter what. I'm going to be with you no matter what comes. And I've got to tell you, we've experienced all those things. We've lived through lack. We've lived through plenty. We've lived through sickness. We've lived through health. We've lived through good times. We've lived through hard times. And we're still together because that's what a covenant is. That's what marriage is supposed to be all about. So after you see that you're in this covenant relationship, it says in verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I want you to see, first of all, it says wives, submit to your own husbands. It didn't say to anybody else's husband. It didn't say to every man. It said to your own husband. And how? As to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord established delegated authority. So whether you like it or not, you're to submit because the Lord says you're to submit. We're doing it as to the Lord. I'm not doing it because my husband is so handsome or he's so strong or he's so courageous. I'm doing it in the Lord. I'm doing it because the Lord said I'm to do it. Now that word submit, oh my goodness. Some of you cringed when you heard that word because of what has been said and thought about it in our society. Some years back, there was an abandonment of Afghanistan, a withdrawal of our troops very quickly, very erratically, and it led to all kinds of a series of problems. But who had hurt maybe the worst were the women that were living there. Since then, the Taliban has set up laws that ban women from going to school. When in public, women are required to wear black coverings from head to toe. They are banned from speaking and singing in public. And people see the word submit and they say, there it is. That's what religion does to women. Well, it wasn't just religion. Paganism did the very same thing. In the Greco-Roman culture, women were treated as slaves they were treated as children. They were excluded from being able to be citizens. People say, well, that's what Christianity does to people. And nothing could be further from the truth. Let me say, Jesus Christ is the great liberator of women. You cannot thank Gloria Steinem for women liberation. You should thank Jesus Christ for women liberation. 
You see, in both the Jewish and the Greco-Roman culture, women were degraded. And I could go on and on about how they were degraded. But let me just say this. When Jesus came to earth, women were drawn to his ministry. Jesus treated women. Read the Gospels. He treated every woman with dignity and respect. Women were the last ones at his cross. Women were the first ones to see him when he rose from the dead. Women were actually the first people to go out and preach the gospel. And in the church of Jesus Christ, there were women who were deacons and pastors and prophetesses and a woman named Junia who actually was an apostle. I want you to see this. Jesus elevated women. That's what Jesus came to do. And this same Jesus who elevated women is saying to women, submit to your husbands. Submit to them for harmony. Submit to them for unity. Submit to them to be in alignment with my will and my purpose. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Now, both the husband and wife are responsible, but the husband has the greater responsibility and also the greater judgment. You know, in any organization or institution, you have to have a leader. I know uh, we have issues with that in our family. Uh, I'm talking about my family of origin. I have uh, three, um, well, in including ourselves, we have three uh, women in our family, um, my two sisters and, of course, Kelly. And all of the husbands are leaders, all three of us. All three of us lead organizations. And we come together. Now, you'd think there would be easy leadership there. But there's no defined leader. We're all leaders. So here's the problem. We try to be kind to one another. We try to defer to one another. We try to want everyone to be able to have what they want. So we come together and no one can make up any body's mind on what we're supposed to do and when we're to do it and nothing gets done so we'll sit around for hours figuring out what we're to do you gotta have a leader now I'm the oldest son so I think I should be the leader but somebody's got to be the leader in this and you know that's true in a family there's got to be a leader and God has ordained that the husband should be the leader in the family. Now, that doesn't mean he makes every decision. I can tell you in my family, I don't make all the decisions. I don't even decide on what I wear. <laughs> Usually when I do decide on what I wear, I regret it later. <laughs> my wife picked out this clothing for me today. I was wearing something completely different before I changed my clothes. <laughs> After some advice and counsel. I do not make decisions on decorations in our home. I do make decisions on our finances because all of us have different expertise. So Kelly and I have decided who has expertise in various areas and that's where we lead. But when push comes to shove, when we come to a decision where there's no certainty and maybe we are not on the same page, it's the husband's responsibility to make the decision. But how does he make the decision? Not on what's going to be best for him, but what's going to be best for the family and with a recognition that I'm to love my wife even to the point of dying for her. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, again, any scripture in the Bible, you have to look at based on the scriptures around it, the chapter that it's in, and the entire Bible. Well, we're taught something in the entire Bible. Everything doesn't, in this case, mean everything. For instance, a husband can never tell a wife to do something that's contrary to the scripture. If he does, she doesn't have to do what he said. He can't ask her to do something that's going to lead into sin. So, so there are stopgap measures to this. There are exceptions to this, and we need to understand it. Let's get to the second key to walking in covenant love, and that is sacrificial Christ-like love. It's what makes submission happen. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, 
just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, this is the only imperative in this verses 22 to 20, 33 passage. These are the, this is it. This is the only imperative. Husbands, love your wives. That's the only command. Husbands, love your wives. And the idea is, if a husband will really love his wife, the wife will naturally submit to her husband because she knows that he wants her best. Now, in practical terms, loving your wife has to do with being her best friend. That's a big part of it. Because I'm, I want you to think about this. The primary reason God created marriage was for companionship. You know, I, for a long time I didn't understand that. Then I read the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 2, God has created man. And he created the entire universe. And everything he created, he said, it's good, it's good, it's good. Then he made man in his own image. And he said, it's very good. And then we come to chapter 2 and it says, it's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. So I'm going to make a helper for him. I'm going to make a partner for him. I'm going to make a companion for him. So the very first need, the very first reason that God made a woman for a man was companionship. And I got to say, that's the main thing marriage should be based on is friendship and companionship. Now, I know in our culture, that's not the norm. The norm is what do they look like? You know, is she hot? That's the thing you hear. You know, I had my wife one time come to me, and she was trying to be really cool about that. And she said, am I still hot? And I said, you're absolutely hot. She said, I know, but it's only in flashes. Um, but, but I think she is. I think she's absolutely beautiful. However, I got to say that over time, women that are hot, become warm in the eyes of the world and then they can even get a little cold because we change over time. Have you noticed these like stunningly beautiful women from when I was a kid and now I look at pictures of them and they're cold. You know, they're not what they, other than Dolly Parton, she's never changed. Airbrushing is amazing. But in any case, if you're basing it on looks, it's not always going to be there like it used to be. But friendship can be. It can get better and better and better. You know, when, when Kelly and I got together, she wasn't looking for a husband at all. She was looking for a friend. She had fully committed her life to Christ, and all the people that used to be in her life weren't following Christ, so she didn't have any friends. And she kept trying to find somebody who loved Jesus the way she loved Jesus. And she started praying and saying, Lord, give me someone as a friend who loves Jesus like I love Jesus. And then we met. And she said, I have a friend who loves Jesus the way I love Jesus. And we sat down and we began to talk. And it was like, you too? You, you feel that way too? You believe that too? This is what you want your life to be about too? And we were friends long before we were a couple. <laughs> because it starts with friendship. And that friendship is so vitally important. Now, it says the husband is to be the head. What does that mean? Well, first of all, he's to be the head servant. Remember, Jesus is our ultimate example. And he was a servant to all. And in John 15, 13, we read, Greater love has no one than this, than that one would lay down his life for his friends. Now, I got to say, that is ultimate love. And it's saying that we're to be companions, we're to be friends, we're to be husband and wife, and the husband is to be willing to lay down his life for his wife. And Paul goes on to say that. <laughs> but you know, there's not that many chances to do that. I can't say that ever in my life have I said, look, a speeding bullet is headed toward Kelly, so whoa, I'll take it for her. You know, that it happens in the movies, but in real life, that doesn't happen that often, right? So we got to be more practical than that. It's like one woman said, you know, her husband was going, honey, I will lay down my life for you. And he said that multiple times. Well, one day after he said that, she said, well, you know, that's wonderful, but could you at least help me with the dishes? 
You know, it's, it's more practical than that. What does it mean to lay down your life for somebody? It means to die to self. That you don't always live for yourself and what you want. You live for the other person and what they want. That is what it means to lay down your life in a much more practical manner. Look at uh, verse 26. What's the purpose? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Now, I believe that Jesus sanctifies us by his word. You know, he justifies us by his blood. We're saved because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And it happened once and it happened for eternity. But there is a process of sanctification where we're becoming more like Jesus. And how are we sanctified? By his word. Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So by the word of God, we're changed. Now, if you want to see your husband or wife become more Christ-like, you need to sanctify them with the word. So I got to tell you, for me personally, I pray God's word over my wife every single day. You know what else I do? I try to affirm her according to the word. And everybody needs affirmation. This is who God made you to be. You're beautiful in Christ. You are created in his image. You're made in the image of God. You're more than a conqueror in Christ. You can do all things through Christ. You are righteous in Christ. You know, you need to speak affirming words based on the scripture, not only over your spouse, but we need to do it over one another. We all need to hear that from one another, who we are in Christ based on the scripture. But you know what else Ephesians says? We're to speak the truth in love. Which means sometimes you have to speak God's word to them to help them grow. But you do it in love. You don't do it to straighten them out. You don't do that to put them down. You do it to help them grow. Kelly has done that so much for me over the years where she's pointed out things in my life where I need to grow. But I know when she says is it's not because I'm getting on her nerves or at least I hope that's not it. She's saying it because she wants me to grow and she sees things where I can grow and how I can become more like Jesus in my character and in my conduct. So we need to do that for each other. Now, I know when we hear the washing of the water of the word, what we like to think about. You know what I like to think about? A nice bubble bath. A nice warm bubble bath. Maybe one with little jacuzzi, you know, tub feature where it's shooting out hot water at you and you're just, woo, you know. I I like to think about laying back and enjoying that. That's not the picture I think this is. I think the washing of the water of the word is more like a hot pot you're in with a Brillo pad. Because you got to get the rough edges rubbed off of you. You know, we all need to be conformed to the image of Christ and it doesn't come through a soothing massage. It comes through the washing of the water of the word, and it's not always easy. And here's something you've got to understand about marriage. Because here's why I say this. People get married and they said, oh, if I just would have married the right person, this would have been way easier. Why is marriage hard? Because that's what marriage is. It's hard. You know, here's the thing. I said this applies to everybody. Well, in friendships, you're to do the same thing. You're to tell things to people and you're to be in relationships with people where you work things out according to the scripture. But but what happens so often, people, when it gets hard, they just leave the friendship. I'm going to go find another friend that isn't so hard to deal with, right? Or a church. You know, we've had so many people leave our church because they don't want to hear how they need to grow in Christ. They don't want to hear how God's word applies to their life in areas where they don't want to hear it. So they say, I'm just going to go find another church where they don't talk about that kind of stuff, where they don't hold me accountable, where they don't provoke me to holiness and righteousness. I'll just find another place. You know, we can all do that. But in marriage, it's not that easy. I mean, you're married to that person. This is a legal deal. It's going to take something to get out of this. And so it makes you work out your issues. 
with a person who knows you better than anyone else. And sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's very, very difficult to grow in righteousness because God didn't give us marriage primarily for our happiness. Believe me, it does bring a lot of happiness. He did it primarily for our holiness. And boy, that'll help a lot of marriages if you just understand that. Verse 27 that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So Jesus is building his church and he's making it more and more like himself. We're not going to see the finale of that till Christ returns and we see him and we're like him. But Christ is constantly working on his church. And... God is constantly working on us as individuals, and he uses marriage to do it. So here's a good question for you. Husbands, is your wife becoming more like Jesus because she's married to you? I think you could say the same thing to wives. Is your husband becoming more like Jesus because he's married to you? You know, something I've told so many couples over time who wanted to get married, I said, can you glorify God better together than you can single? Paul, the apostle, said, I can do it better single. Well, he better stay single. But if you can do it better together as a couple, you need to get married. Because life isn't about us, it's about glorifying God. I'm just not getting many amens today. (laughs) Verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You know, we tend to be so selfish. It's all about us. And it's learning to die to our own desires to consider the other person's desires. To live not just for ourselves, but to live for them. And notice in this, it's particularly pointed to husbands. Because their responsibility comes first. Verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just like the Lord does the church. Husbands and wives are to nurture and cherish each other just as Christ nurtures and cherishes the church. So husbands, do your wives feel nurtured and cherished? You know, you can say you love them, but do they feel loved? And sometimes you have to do those things that help them to feel loved because not everybody feels loved the same way. Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages, and he talked about things like uh, physical touch, like gifts, like acts of service, like uh, words of affirmation. But these are all things that make people feel loved. And for some people, one thing is at a higher level than others. For my wife, Kelly, gifts are a very high um, way that she feels loved. When I give her gifts, she feels loved. And I hate to shop. I don't know if there's anything I hate more than shopping. I absolutely hate it. I can't tell you how much I hate shopping. But I get her gifts. And Amazon and I have become very good friends. (laughs) Because that's how she feels loved. And I think the best way to find out that is not to take some diagnostic test, but just to ask them, what do I do that makes you feel loved? Do you feel loved by me? And how can I make you feel more loved? We need to have those kind of conversations. I got an amen. (laughs) Verse 30. For we are members of his body and his flesh and of his bone. So we are so members of Christ that we are part of his body. We're called the body of Christ. Now, we all have bodies. We have physical bodies. You need to take care of your body. But that doesn't just mean you pamper your body. It just doesn't mean pedicures and and massages and hot tubs. You know what else it means? You got to eat certain foods that maybe you'd prefer not to eat. You got to exercise your body. And if you're really serious about it, you exercise it hard and you may have lactic muscle, uh, lactic acid build up in your muscles and get really sore after a workout. And it doesn't feel good, but, but you're growing, you're developing, you're, you're staying healthy. And too many of us think, God, since I committed to you, why aren't you making me more happy? Why isn't everything in my life just going well? Why isn't everything roses and songs and lovely niceties? 
you know, and, and people feel that way about their marriage as well. But that's not what makes you healthy. That is not what turns you into the image of Christ. We need hardship. I don't like this sermon. <laughs> but it's true. We need difficulty. We need stressors at times. We need to stretch our faith. I'm going through something right now that is stretching my faith way beyond anything I want to be stretched. But it's necessary if I'm going to become like Christ. And here's my final observation, the final key to covenant relationships. And that is covenant commitment. Verse 31. And this is the key passage to marriage. This is it. This is the one you really want to know. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is talking about the original couple, how God made them one flesh, and all of us are to become one flesh. We're to become one. That's what a couple is supposed to do. We're in a covenant together, we're committed to each other, and we're to become more and more committed over the years. We're in a covenant together commitment. But that covenant commitment can be difficult. And let me say, when people get married, there's some things that really get in the way. Let me tell you one of the big ones is expectations. Look back at your text. It says, leave your father and mother and be joined to your wife. There's a leaving process and there's a cleaving process. And if the leaving never happens, it's difficult to have the cleaving. When Kelly and I got married, her family lived about five miles from us. We immediately moved 750 miles away from them. We left them. And that was, I think, one of the best things that could have happened to our marriage, to be, to be honest. But listen, there are some couples that they live across the street from their parents, but they still leave them. There's others that live 750 miles away and they've never left them. And there's all kinds of ways we don't leave them. And that, like I said, one of them is expectations. Uh, we had a couple that served with us in ministry. And this couple, great couple, dynamic. But her father just pampered, 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 pampered her mother. To the point where the mother never filled her own gas tank. So that when the father passed, she didn't know how to put gas in her car. So they get married, and she says, honey, uh, you know, I'm about out of gas. And he said, okay, go fill it. You know, she didn't feel loved by that because her expectation is my husband's going to fill my gas tank. Okay, that's kind of unrealistic. <laughs> and we bring those kind of expectations into marriage. Let, let me give you an example. Here's her expectation. He's going to financially take care of me. While his expectation is she's going to provide a second income. His expectation is she's always going to be passionate. Her expectation is he's always going to be romantic. His expectation is she's going to keep the house clean and make me meals. She says he's going to help around the house and he's going to take me out to dinner. Okay, those are very different expectations. And when our expectations aren't met, we can get really frustrated in marriage. Proverbs 13, 12 says, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. And so here's the problem. We bring expectations from our family of origin into our marriages, and sometimes they're unrealistic expectations, and other times they're simply not talked about. You need to talk about them. Why did I have these expectations? Are these proper expectations? Can I expect this of you? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to make this a pre-marriage counseling session, but um, let me give you another one. Sometimes people don't leave the wounds and the hurts. You know, there's some wound a, a woman has from her father, and then she takes it out on her husband because of what her father did. Those have to be dealt with. Maybe you need to see a godly Christian counselor from the Word of God who will, who will show you from the Word of God how to get free from those things. But see, those are all things that, that can be a problem in marriage that need to be worked out. And it's not easy. I want to stress this. It's not, it's not easy to have a really good marriage because you've got two people who by nature are selfish 
and they're going to have to submit to one another, and they're going to have to submit to God to become one flesh. Here, somebody gave a definition of one flesh. I wrote this down, I don't know, 30 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. I've repeated it multiple times, but here's what one flesh is. He said marriage is a lot like making mashed potatoes. Two individual potatoes are skinned alive and thrown into hot water. They stay there and sweat it out together in intense heat. After an insufferably long period of time, the cook tastes a masher and crushes them until you can't tell one from the other. They look alike. They taste alike. They act alike. They talk alike. They are one flesh. And that's what it can feel like. Does anybody feel like they're in hot water today? He says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Our marriages should be a visible manifestation of the invisible church of Jesus Christ. Verse 33, nevertheless, this is the last verse. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Boy, that's an important verse. Women need to feel loved. They need to feel cherished. They need to feel protected and cared for. Men need respect. Does your husband feel respected? You say, well, my husband isn't always honorable. But if you'll treat him with honor and respect, it's amazing how he may become more honorable and respecting. My wife isn't always lovely and lovable. Well, if you love her right and love her the right way, it's amazing how much more lovable she'll become. Folks, we have the responsibility. Oh, I just married the wrong person. No, maybe you're just acting the wrong way. The amens have been so hard to come by today. <laughs> Let me just say, I've made marriage sound tough. There's one reason. It is but it's worth it. It's so worth it. You know, when Kelly came into my life, my life went up and to the right. Everything about my life became better. And there've been times that have been very difficult and very hard, but I got to tell you, there's no one I love more on this planet. There's no one who has done more to help me become more like Jesus. There's no one that I'd rather spend my life with and I cannot imagine living life without her. And that's what happens when you become one flesh. But it's hard, it's not easy. It, there, there's challenges to it. There's a lot of forgiving that has to happen. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Now I wanna to say to those of you maybe who've been through divorce, maybe you're single now, you know, folks, God always, 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 always redeems always redeems in various ways. And God has a plan and a purpose for every single life in this auditorium. For some of you, he has a spouse. For some of you, he has a great mission that he wants you to accomplish, a great purpose for you where he wants you to be single. I don't know where you're at. I don't know your situation, but I know God does. And I know out of it, he's going to receive glory. He's going to receive honor and he's going to fulfill his purpose. So let's pray together. Father, I pray for every person in this auditorium. I pray for those marriages that need healing and restoration. Pray for those marriages that are dynamic and successful now, Lord. I pray that they would even mentor and encourage others in their marriage. I pray for single people who want to get married, that you would bring just the right person into their life. And they'd look beyond the superficial, and they would see, Lord, if this is truly a friend, a companion, someone who holds the same values and the same direction for life. Father, I pray for every one of us that we would strengthen all of our relationships. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.